this is Bally Pit, the Safari Cave Flip Podcast. He, he would tell them, he said, well, shall we go have lunch now? Said, yes, okay, let's go downstairs and we'll have some lunch. He'd take them downstairs, and on top of the little five-foot refrigerator was a, a uh, styrofoam cup that had uh, 10 cents written on it, and that was 10 cents that you, you do on the honor system to buy a packet of cup of soup. This is the way he would entertain people, because you were, you were stuck out in the middle of nowhere, you know, it's 20 minutes to get to a restaurant, but he would actually pull coins out of his pocket and say, my treat. I'm Kevin Savitz, and this is an interview episode of Antic, the Atari 8-bit podcast. John Schulte and Faradun Moynihan were both employees at Dorset Educational Systems, the company that created the talk and teach educational cassette tapes, which were sold by Atari. Dorset also sold many more cassette-based classes directly via mail order for the Atari, TRS-80 color computer, and other platforms. Faradun worked primarily as a programmer, and John was primarily an editor. As my co-interviewer for this discussion, I invited Thomas Cherry Holmes, an expert in the technical aspects of the talk and teach system. I interviewed Thomas previously on this podcast in Antic Interview 57. Nearly every educational cassette tape that Dorset released for the Atari has been digitized. They're all available at archive.org. There's a link in the show notes at ataripodcast.com. This interview took place on June 25th, 2015. I brought in Thomas, who is my colleague. He is an, a modern Atari guy, and his kind of claim to fame is that he has figured out the the system used on the the uh, Dorset cassette tapes, and even wrote software to make compatible new software <laughs> using it that runs on it. Sorry. It, so. No, it, it's something to laugh at because you must ask <laughs> the qu- you must ask yourself the question. Why? <laughs> well, I mean, for, you know, from my perspective, if what you guys were doing at Dorset, especially at the time, nobody else was doing it. This, uh, this idea of uh, combining uh, visual and audio media together on a computer could only be done in a handful of ways, and you didn't have really the memory to do it any other way than the way it was done at the time. So, you know, hats off to you. <laughs> yeah, well, I think that's one of the the things that that made, made Lloyd Dorset a genius, frankly. Yes. Uh, he was leagues ahead of his time for other people in the same space doing educational programming. Of course, you know his background coming out of uh, doing teaching machines uh, in the audiovisual space, uh, which is where he started uh, back in the 60s. And he got a number of degrees and a number of patents related to uh, doing audiovisual and software development for those different systems. Mm-hmm. So, and even even before that, doing uh, uh, as Dorset Labs doing uh, audio systems for uh, large scale projection. I mean, he he was an early uh, multi channel, uh, an early developer of multi channel sound for large theaters as well. Yeah, it was it was quite an interesting installation when you, when you went to the Goldsby Airport. In, uh, just south of Norman, Oklahoma, uh, he had he had built what was considered uh, his dream house for his wife, and it was this big cracker box two story home that, as soon as he took his wife out for her anniversary, said, "You know, here's where we're going to retire." She looked at it and said, "Take me home, Lloyd." Uh, <laughs> it, it was very. It was a very odd structure because you know very practical engineering type of building just every nook and cranny was filled because it was a perfect cracker box mm-hmm. <laughs> it just had no aesthetic value whatsoever uh, uh, so he, he then converted the building as uh, one of his other businesses uh, I, I think uh, was starting to fail he had a lot of Department of Defense contracts uh, which you may or may not have heard about uh, he, he was one of the um, Designers of the pregnant guppy for the DoD, and okay. when those when those uh, other businesses just started going away because he wasn't getting the same kind of contracts, and uh, Faradun can speak to his his traffic accident that, that destroyed his genius. Uh, hmm. so there's a great story there, 
but in the in the course of that time, the the conversion of the building into uh, what became Dorset Educational Systems. When you walk in, um, it, it, it you walked in basically to an entry room that was the the living room, and off to the left, and it hallwayed off into what became known affectionately by his employees as the Museum of Science and Technology, which was a a hybrid and mishmash of just every type of machine that ever existed, including old dead video platforms, like Sanyo had a videotape system before there was VHS or beta, and he had all these different systems, and they were all operational, they were working, and they were integrated into somehow the teaching uh, business of co doing computer-aided instruction. Um, and his, mm -hmm. his, his core engineer uh, was uh, a gentleman named Cleve Chapman, who was from the Navy. Is that right, Faradun? Um, I believe so. He was yeah. an engineer, yes. Yeah, and he was, you know, he was the one who, who kind of, along with uh, Jim, and i sorry I can't remember his last name, a uh, lovely gentleman, the two of them were the engineers who made all this stuff work. And Lloyd was the visionary and, and put all the pieces together and assembled a team of uh, young college kids and people like Faradun, who was beyond a young college kid and a really very bright programmer way ahead of his time and put together a team of designers and writers um, to convert these audiovisual scripts that he had for the teaching machine business into um, initially the Atari programs that, that everybody is talking about yep. today. All right, so I'd like to kind of go back a little bit and talk about how each of you got started at Dorset, how you got your jobs there, basically, you know, and uh, I'm a little confused about Oklahoma. I mean, that's not exactly the hotbed of technology, so I'm wondering why, why uh, it was all out there. Yes, um, I believe I started before John. Um, my story is that I had just finished my master's degree in computer science at OU and um, was, uh, didn't really know what I wanted to do, and I wanted to just gain some experience in my field and uh, I believe I ran into this little ad that uh, Dorset was running in, in paper. And, uh, and I went out there and I applied and, uh, and uh, he hired me and I started um, in 1981, uh, um, summer of 81, I believe. And uh, my job was to uh, um, basically uh, combine... Um, uh, audio and uh, graphics onto uh, uh, what he used to call broad tape. And um, uh, I had a little cubicle on the second floor as uh, uh, John explained about the structure of that building. And um, uh, soon after that, um, uh, he hired John plus another fellow, Tim. And um, then I got to know John and we became really good friends and we had uh, a lot of fun time at uh, at Dorset. So that's about all I can say, unless you have any other questions. Okay. Um, John, how'd you get started? Uh, let's see. Um, I was still a student at the University of Oklahoma, finishing up my program and um, looking for supplemental income, and was um, drawn to an ad in the Norman Transcript uh, for a writer, uh, which was what I was studying in school. And I answered the ad and I got uh, interviewed by Lloyd in his office and was enchanted and intrigued by how eccentric and eclectic everything was in this place. Um, and he hired me on the spot um, and introduced me to people that I already knew because some of them were already going to the University of Oklahoma or, or were friends of friends. Mm -hmm. And uh, uh, and yeah, and then you know, Faradun and I became very good friends. In fact, probably too good of friends that we, we ended up, uh, you know, lots of shenanigans at Dorset. When especially when when Lloyd would take uh, visitors out for walks around, uh, I guess what could be considered a, a crude version of a, an Apple campus, which amounted <laughs> to a walk around the parking lot about an acre uh, of real estate that cornered on the Goldsby Airport. Goldsby being a very very small um, airport for you know local commuter flights, and uh, is right off the freeway, and there was really nothing else down there uh, hmm. at the time, um, 
And let's see, I guess you're pretty early on because the place was so odd. Um, I couldn't stand the idea of working in a cubicle, so I usurped one of the rooms that was being used as a storage, a big giant storage dump, uh, cleaned all the stuff out and took over a big office in the back corner <laughs> right behind Faraday's cubicle. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, and that was my home. And it was great because I had a strategic vantage point. I could see anyone coming. Uh, if I was you know, busy playing chess with one of the other employees, I could quickly turn my terminal back on and start to work. Mm-hmm. <laughs> <laughs> so as a, as a writer, were you writing the, the content of these, uh, the scripts? Well, I guess the, the better term would be uh, editing. Uh, there was a little bit of creation going on because of the contracts that Lloyd was picking up. He got a contract after Atari to port everything over to the uh, TRS-80 color computer, which is where a lot of the work that uh, Faraday and I did mostly. And um, so there was some script creation in that form. But on the Atari level, most of what I would what, what I did was I would consider it to be more of an editing capacity and massaging graphics, again, ASCII graphics, uh, who, who, who could ask for anything better to operate in. Uh, the challenges of, of making things uh, reflective of the content that was, that was being spoken at the time on the, on, on the broad tape, uh, you, know, you get the, the 90 hertz blast of digital data that would go out through the tape and then uh, the machine would then um, start up the cassette and play uh, the recording, which was a terrific voice artist from Oklahoma. His name is Dave Stanton, who recorded, I think, pretty much all of the programs except for a few of them for English as a Second Language, which was, I believe, the program that was authored by, uh, by Lloyd himself, and he got his son-in-law to do the voiceover for them, uh, James Mather. Um, I don't know why these names are coming back to me, but they are haunting me. <laughs> Uh, yep, and the, uh, the 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 course of doing the ESL uh, and all this all the programs for the Atari system, as far as when I got involved in Atari, was actually when I left Oklahoma for California, and got hired by a company that was licensing intellectual property rights from Lloyd to use the same programs again onto even more platforms. Uh, these guys were way ahead of their time in terms of what they were doing. In fact, um, they were so far ahead of their times that the Internal Revenue did a lot of looking into what they were doing because they, they were basically licensing out the same content over and over but to different platforms. And mm-hmm. um, you know, the service didn't, ha- didn't have an understanding of what that meant. So um, consequently, you know, I got involved in uh, doing uh, copyright transfers, uh, you know, updating screens with with different owners for different programs, and and tweaking the graphics along the way. Um, the gra- I think graphics is a very fascinating part of all this because the 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 gentleman who was just the master at coming up with ASCII art at Dorset was an, a gentleman named uh, Jerry, and I can't. Faraday and I were talking earlier. We we can't come up with his last name unfortunately, and I remember looking him up maybe 10 years ago to see what he was up to. I knew his name, his full name then, and there was like no uh, footprint of him anywhere on the internet. So I, he just elusively disappeared, which is a perfect ending to him. Uh, <laughs> but the ASCII art that he was, that he created at the time is, as you folks probably know now from looking at some of the programs, since you've got an, a way to emulate it is the, is just amazing. Um, you know, what Sheridan and I were doing was, I would say comparatively much more crude, <laughs> um, Faradun, you, you took a lot of uh, a lot of the design uh, input too. From uh, uh, what was the the woman's name that worked in the design department that you worked with? Uh, Charlotte. Charlotte, right? Yeah, Charlotte Chandler. Yeah, she was very talented too. Yeah, I I do recall that. Uh, speaking of graphics, um, we had a uh, camera uh, attached to. Uh, to our basically a, a little platform, and um, next to our computer and the and the uh, the, the tape recorder, 
and we would use the um, uh, the camera, I believe, to capture uh, an image, like a photo, you might say, and then transfer it in, in digital form and um, um, combine it with, like I said, text, audio, onto a, a, a broad tape. And, um, uh, of course, in a, uh, in a sequential form. Um, so you would basically display uh, uh, the piece of text, as I recall, as I remember, followed by um, uh, graphics, uh, an image or a photo that we had taken, captured with the camera, followed by an audio. And, um, and then after that, uh, uh, the, the, somehow, I, I don't recall how they would... Uh, we would include uh, uh, a, 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 a position where the, uh, uh, the the person who was viewing and, and, and listening to these uh, tutorial programs, there were some uh, frames in which there would be a question, and uh, the uh, the person using the program could uh, select. It was like a multiple choice question, uh, uh, A, B, C, or there were three buttons involved. They could uh, select one, two, three. On the uh, on the keyboard mm -hmm. to respond to those. I don't remember how that was implemented, but nevertheless, that that was uh, our our job, or at least my job, to combine um, audio and text and uh, um, uh, graphics that we were capturing with this camera. Where uh, Cleve Chapman was the designer of of that whole system mostly, and uh, then these uh, broad tapes would. Uh, be sent off to somewhere and they would uh, be converted to cassette tapes and uh, and then uh, it would be mass produced and uh, be sold in the market mm -hmm. so yeah, that's now as far okay sorry just as an, as an interruption probably as a clarification for our listeners when uh as I know broad tape uh am I, I'm assuming that this is a quarter inch master of some sort it's quarter inch reel to reel Right. Yes, exactly right. Yeah. Okay, so, like, uh, if if you're if, I, if our listeners want to see what that is, go Google, uh, for example, Ampex four five six tape, and you'll see what that looks like. Yeah, okay. but most of the most of the machines that we used were were Sony's, and uh, they were very <laughs> they were workhorses. They 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 went morning, noon, and night developing mm -hmm. software. I'm curious, Faradun. Um, what your workstation look like? I, I'd like to know more about the, the process of combining this stuff. And so, what kind, what machine were you were you sitting in front of when you were combining the audio and 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 text and, and graphics? Um, first of all, I think I do have somewhere one photo of myself in my cubicle. If I ever find it, I'll be more than happy to share it with you guys. Um, Yay. I. Uh, and also, speaking of that, by the way, I, I still live in Oklahoma. I live in Lawton, which is uh, 80 miles uh, southwest of uh, Norman. And in fact, I'll be going that way tomorrow, this weekend. And uh, I may even go by um, uh, the famous Goldsby Airport and see if that <laughs> structure is still there and snap a photo and, and send it to you guys <laughs> Thank you. As, a, as a souvenir. But... Uh, but nevertheless, um, if I recall correctly, uh, I was uh, pretty much just working with the uh, Radio Shack's color computer uh, mm -hmm. when they first came out. Yeah, I had uh, a Radio Shack color computer in front of me. To my left, there was um, there was a camera uh, mm -hmm. attached to to an arm pointing downward towards the uh, uh, the table. And then uh, to my right, there was one of those uh, reel-to-reel um, tape systems. And uh, that was the setup that I had in front of me, as I recall. You, you also had, because uh, I had the same thing, an amplifier box that, uh, that everything was processed through. And we also had um, uh, an, another, another audio source so that we could... We could we could combine the audio that was already mastered from previous recordings because these recordings were all done for teaching machines originally. Mm -hmm. So we had a way to it, to output audio. I, I don't know if it, I can't remember if it was cassette based. Probably was. Um, and then that the cassette audio went into the real it went into this integrated box that amplified the sound and also then 
uh, flowed it through to the reel-to-reel on one of the channels. So, the, as I recall, Faraday, and this is basically, they took the stereo channel and they made, one channel was for audio, one channel was for the digital bursts of, of data, and yep. you would record them back and forth, and we'd sit there and, you know, flip the switches back and forth, uh, and yes. it was it was a, a manual timing thing. You had to, you know, get the... You had you had to know that the, the data burst was done because you could hear it. It was it would it would uh, you know you hear that ninety hertz tone squelching Bleed through the speaker, and then once it once it got done, you'd flip your switch onto your audio, and the whole time the broad tape is running and recording and this this compilation then, and that's how it, it all got put together frame by frame, and when you were done with the with the total program, which ran maybe forty frames something like that. Yes. Yes. Uh, you know, combined with the audio, then that completed one of the programs. So if you screwed up, you know, 20 minutes in, did you have to start over, or could you go back and finish? You could, yeah, you could just go back and erase wherever you, you made yes. it safe. And that, actually, and that actually pans out, too, because I've been doing a good deal of studying of the uh, synchronization of the, uh, of the audio and the uh, FSK portions of the tape, and it is very much done it is very much done ad hoc because i can literally see portions where uh, the data uh, the data bursts get overwritten in certain spots because of corrections and the like it it yeah. looked to be a very manual process yeah <laughs> so, yeah sometimes we made mistakes <laughs> yes yes we did but the final uh, john is very right he's got a, an amazing memory remembering all of these things but uh, the final product on these cassette tapes um, it, it, correct me if I'm wrong, John. Uh, it was a sequential uh, uh, set of data uh, on on a cassette tape. First came uh, the uh, the uh, the text, and then graphics, and then the audio. In that yeah. that order. Yeah, that's that correct. could be the that could be the yeah that that seems to be the case for the color computer stuff, which I have yet to see. Uh, the the Atari format stuff is ever so slightly different. The Atari stuff is literally streamed uh, synchronously with the yeah. uh, with the voice data. That's right. That that is the distinction between the two platforms. That's because of the way the Atari, what they call it, the talk and teach system. Yes, it was, a, it was the cartridge thing. Yes, yeah. I. I'm, I'm, and and that's something that I really want to look into, especially is the the early versions of Talk and Teach, because I happen to know that Talk and Teach goes back a couple of years before Atari licensed it, and I would love to know the pieces that made up that early platform, because at this point, I've only been able to guess based on based on forensic analysis of what yeah. I've been looking well, at. So the 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 guy that was that was there that you need to get a hold of uh, if he's still around is is Jerry. Uh, and we'll come up with his last name, I promise you. <laughs> uh, and that was probably in the mid-70s, uh, because I remember Lloyd telling me that he developed this this talk and teach system with Atari, or for Atari, and had it patented and everything ready to go, and then Atari licensed it, which is where the revenue stream came from, for Lloyd to start up uh, all the other... Uh, you know, he basically financed one off of the other, right? So mm -hmm. Atari launched it, and then that led to... Uh, showcasing it to the people down in Dallas Fort Worth that uh, Tandy and then Tandy said we want to be on board we want access to your 1024 programs the, the binary number that it is and uh, you know off off they went and then uh, uh, Tandy led into a, a, a deal with Apple and Apple then I think time at Sinclair was one uh, they did one for Commodore 64 so these other platforms, the Apple II, the Commodore 64, were they variants of Talk and Teach, or were they based on the newer color, com the newer tech that you did for the color computer? Okay, every everything was based upon the same programs, uh, text-wise, that Lloyd mostly wrote himself, and yes. uh, that's a that's a that's a great story too. Is that Lloyd was a very stream of conscious writer and uh, let daily life affect his his writing skills. I remember one, my, my favorite one is uh, Faradun, wasn't this English as a second language? Lloyd was on his way back from a trip to Midland, Texas, and he got a toothache or something along those lines. And so at the very beginning of, the, of one of the programs, it's, uh, it's 50 miles to Midland, 50 miles. Press 50 miles. And on the screen, on the screen, it would be 50 miles. And you'd have to press 
it would say 50 miles, 75 miles, 100 miles, you know. <laughs> so you'd find the button, the responding button, taking the computer, distilling it down to its its essence, one, two, and three, and you'd press the key, and, and you yes. would get, you know, a, a remedial response of that's correct or that's incorrect. So everything had positive reinforcement. If you were right, you would get a, a screen that would flash some kind of, you know, positive reinforcement. If you were wrong, it would tell you you're wrong, try again. Uh, yeah. Not to discourage people, you had to be very, because Lloyd, you know, he did his dissertation in how to how to teach children. Uh, he did, these teaching machines were done for kids that were left behind in the South. Uh, and, and he was all about trying to empower them and get them you know, back up to a level that was more respectable and, and brought them dignity without making them feel stupid. So he was, he was very, very much, uh, in, in all seriousness, he was very, very smart about not trying to make anyone feel bad or humiliate anybody through his teaching programs. And mm -hmm. this, this program that was English as a second language, uh, because he got a toothache, um, and it worked its way in as he was sitting there writing uh, on his way back from Midland, Texas, integrated into the script is, what's the matter with the tooth? What's the matter? <laughs> what's the matter? And th this is the, this is kind of the you know the flavor of, of now on the converse side and to the other extreme, uh, there was you know a, a very robust series of uh, programs for psychology and meat technology and all kinds you know auto mechanics <laughs> construction carpentry. He was all over the place. Digital electronics. Yes. Yeah. He yes. Has, it's because he's got his background in you know electronics and um, and engineering. I was disappointed to see that uh, in my research there there was a film strip for meat cutting, but that yes. was not transferred to an Atari version. <laughs> now, we hadn't we hadn't gotten to the, any of the the meat technology or meat uh, transfer. Uh, the, all that stuff hadn't been done yet. That was on the that was definitely on the block of things to do though. I think he was looking for someone who would actually want the programs first. <laughs> sure. Yes. Um, I was telling John uh, earlier that as a souvenir, I, I kept uh, uh, one of uh, Lloyd's uh, uh, binders uh, uh, that he used to uh, use to sell uh, eight cassettes, and I have it, in fact, right in front of me. And I'm looking at these eight cassettes, and uh, I'm just reading some of the titles for you guys. One of them is uh, called The Electric Car, uh, which goes back to November 1982 for TRS-80 uh, color computer. That the was other one is, <laughs> Yes. And the, the other one is The Age of Television. And, uh, and then there's one called Funds and Real Estate. Uh, so as John says, uh, in terms of the subjects, he was just all over the place, and uh, which uh, going thinking back, it's just at that time it didn't dawn on me. But now that I look at it, it's it's rather strange and bizarre for someone who may want to as an educator, because I I teach at the university. As an educator, it's it's ironic how a person could specialize in, in teaching every subject that there is in the world. But uh, um, Lloyd was an interesting character. And in fact, I think his middle initial was G, I, I believe. Mm -hmm. Lloyd G. Dorset. And, uh, and uh, John and I used to refer to him as Lloyd God Dorset. <laughs> <laughs> oh. um, so the Atari versions were technically different from the versions from the other platforms, as I understand it. Yes. Be because, so were all the other platforms, they were the same, correct? I mean, the, well, it, the Apple it, it, and the it, Coco, and that was like the same cassette would work on all those machines? No, 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 they wouldn't work on, say, that, that's where on the engineering side, that there was a lot of, uh, a lot of work that was done way outside of the realm of what, of what we did, uh, down with uh, Jim and, uh, and Cleve. Uh, they were the, they were the ones who got things to work using compilers, and they they were basically created at the end of the, uh, at the end of the process of getting everything to to work. Um, a uh, I forget what we call I guess it was like an authoring program. So we would load in uh, like for the TRS-80 color computer, we'd load in the M400 application into the computer, and then that would allow us to do the compiling. 
So it was it was basically a a, a facilitation application. Okay. So they, they were in every one of those machines, every one of those platforms had their own way of accessing to be able to put these programs together. Oh. Just okay. from an inventory perspective, that must have been a mess just just managing all those cassette tapes. <laughs> yeah. yeah it, it, well, but everything was, you know, still very fun. Again, remember remember the cracker box. You can fit a lot of things in a cracker box mm. because everything is square. Right, right. <laughs> <laughs> um all right, I have another question. So in, in digitizing hundreds of tapes, we've noticed that there are tapes uh, labeled M200 that are, I think, blue labels, and there's tapes marked M200A that have green labels, but they seem to be identical, except for the labels. Do you have any idea why? Um, the only thing I can think of is M200A may be ones with audio and M200 without doesn't have audio. Mm-mm. 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 No, they're both they're, they're both identical. I'm there may be revisions, but I couldn't find any differences in the content of either one. And so. yeah, I'd have to, I'd have to think deep and hard about that. I'm, <laughs> I, I don't know. You're, I mean, you're, you're dealing with over thirty years of history right. here. Yeah, I know some of these. Yeah, that that's a way. really obscure question. I know, but you know, it's something that came up. So I'm sorry I have failed the test. <laughs> <laughs> Did you have any insight into um, the the financial side of things? I know it wasn't your job, but maybe I mean I'm just kind of curious about what the what Dorset got for licensing these things to Atari or to any other company. Uh, not specifically. I mean, we knew that there were there there was licensing activity going on. Uh, no question about that. And I know that there was a lot of funny stuff going on with regards to what the perception was in the world and what the information was that was. That was put out in, in terms of press releases and so on. Uh, what do you mean? Well, uh, well, Lloyd was was very upfront about the fact that the Atari system uh, sold you know hundreds of thousands of units, but I believe Atari uh, ultimately canceled the license contract because they said they weren't selling robustly enough. That kind of thing. So a little bit of a dichotomy in between, you know, the guy who owns the company and the people who are licensing it. Mm-hmm. Yep. And you're not the first person that has mentioned that, so, hmm. (laughs) Yeah, well, you know, uh, Lloyd was a businessman. He did do some bloviating, um, but he was also, uh, again, a great insight into the company. He was very frugal. Uh, My my recollection of him being a, a frugal man, but also... You know, kind of clearly very generous. There, there was no no question that he was there exploiting college kids because he could get them to work for five bucks an hour or whatever it was. Uh, but at the same time, uh, if you ever came up short of cash and you walked into his office, he'd jump out of his chair and pull out a wad of twenties and say, "Do you need some pocket money?" <laughs> um, and then at the same time, you have executives coming from around the country looking to invest or license his software. And he would take them down, and he he, he would tell them, he said, "Well, shall we go have lunch now?" Said, yes, okay. Let's go downstairs. And we'll have some lunch. He'd take them downstairs, and on top of the little five foot refrigerator was a a uh, styrofoam cup that had uh, ten cents written on it, and that was ten cents that you you do on the honor system to buy a packet of cup of soup, and <laughs> that, was your, that was your lunch. And he had an old, uh, you know, Coca-Cola machine. If you wanted to get a soft drink, uh, that was another ten cents. <laughs> and this, this is the way he would entertain people because you were, you were stuck out in the middle of nowhere. You know, it's twenty minutes to get to a restaurant, so he would treat everybody. And he would actually say this, and you always wonder, he, what was he just being wry and kind of checking people out? But he would actually pull coins out of his pocket and say, "My treat." <laughs> dump the change into the cup, <laughs> and he did this. He did this with a gentleman that that I worked with out here in California, named Chris Cherick, who was one of the licensed uh, a lot of the, the uh, programs for different uh, platforms. And you know, Chris was a very, very professional, well dressed, you know, California swanky business guy who uh, who w- should have been impressed. And instead, he got treated to a you know cup of soup. But I remember talking to him later about it, and he was 
he was quite uh, taken by it. He thought it was it was charming. <laughs> Faridun, you've been very quiet. I don't I don't talk much. I, I enjoy listening to to John <laughs> because he does have a great recollection of things. But but he is very right, uh, Lloyd. Uh, was a very interesting character at 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 one end in terms of the technology he was really uh, a visionary he had some interesting concepts and ideas and uh, but at at a personal level this was a different character and uh, very frugal and uh, I do remember vividly those uh, um, those ten cent cup of soups and uh, and he didn't uh, I don't know how much he was paying John but. Um, he was really exploiting us in terms of the, 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 the money and salary because he um, he wasn't paying much. Uh, I don't know. I think he started me off with like paying me uh, um, two two three dollars an hour, uh, something like that. Um, and uh, um, and and once in a while he would uh, give us a maybe like a ten cent raise. I think he was really <laughs> fond of the decimal system. Everything was. Uh, yeah, ten cents or five cents raise, and uh, so very interesting character. But it's, but, but Faraday, at the same time, in fairness to Lloyd, it, it never had the sense that he was being um, exploitive, even though he clearly was. Th- there was a sense that that he genuinely said, "You know, you've done a good job. I'm going to give you a ten cent an hour raise." And th- there was a sincerity and conviction and a and, and a and a real kind of. It's, it warmed his heart to know that he was going to give you a ten cent an hour raise because you were doing a really good job. <laughs> also, I believe I think he told me I think he um, uh, really thought that he was also uh, teaching us. We were learning something uh, uh, interesting and exciting, and uh, so that would make up for uh, for not paying us what I guess he was supposed to. Uh, he really uh, I think. I remember him telling me when when he was interviewing me that that how much uh, I'm going to be learning and on on this on this job, and of course I did. I uh, now that I look back, but uh, nevertheless, it's a very he was indeed a very interesting character. Did you feel at the time uh, for either of you? Did, did either of you feel at the time that uh, you were doing this that you were doing something uh, innovative? that you were doing something different? Um, I think to a certain degree, yes. I do remember when John was talking about uh, Lloyd's uh, trips. Um, at some point, uh, Lloyd took me on a, on a trip, a uh, business trip to Fort Worth, to, uh, to Tandy. This is probably when we were, he was trying to sell the... Uh, um, the concept uh, of um, using the color computer, and uh, so I went on a trip with him to to Tandy, and uh, where we presented uh, uh, his his product, and uh, and uh, so that to me was a was a big thing for someone young who was just coming out of uh, college with, with virtually no experience, and uh, um, I didn't know the extent of. Uh, um, the, what we were doing, because back then, of course, there was no internet. We didn't have really a good feel as to what else was out there in terms of uh, uh, in other places, other states, and what people were using to uh, for tutorial programs. We didn't really have a good grasp of that uh, as we do today. So, to for a certain degree, I I think I we felt. Uh, like we were doing something quite interesting, very different. I, I, in graduate school, I didn't do any of this stuff. I didn't work with graphics. I didn't work with camera. I, uh, I could write programs. I could create compilers. I could do all of those. But uh, combining audio and video and graphics and uh, and mixing them and trying to uh, putting a little bit of uh, artistic features into these programs, that was something quite different. And of course, um, my biggest savior was meeting talented people, uh, very funny people such as John and uh, and others at at Dorset. Uh, for some reason, I don't know why, John can um, maybe uh, uh, elaborate on this. That some of the, the most of the characters that that Lloyd uh, employed at 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 Dorset, 
they were very interesting. I guess I'm going to use the word interesting. And uh, so, uh, so we formed an interesting friendship and relationship within the company with the uh, with with other employees, and uh, that that I have really fond memories. And um, maybe John can also uh, mention about uh, uh, making a little um, movie out of that uh, work environment. <laughs> and uh, and that that that's that's a very interesting story. John, go ahead. Oh, thanks. <laughs> uh, well, I guess going back to the to the question first, um, I, I I always looked at the place as as, as a real uh, fascinating set of contradictions. You had downstairs this museum of technology, which was sort of a graveyard of past technologies. Um, it, it was just a, a, a again a conglomeration of just everything from junk to what the heck is that <laughs> and just, you know inventions and things that Lloyd had patented and didn't get to market and things that just didn't work out and it, and there was do you remember he also uh, Ferdy, he had a giant organ that he he created and, and oh, patented yes, yes. yeah you're that right, was also right. that, that was in the museum and we had, I think one weekend we actually got it to work and it was you know it's fascinating and because of that uh, that the oddity of the place, I think when you put people into that 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 kind of environment, that it brings out everybody's you know eccentric nature, um, and yeah, it just yeah that we had Princeton graduates working there um, being exploited because they were in Oklahoma. What else were they going to do? <laughs> uh, it's either that or the University of Oklahoma. Those were your two choices. Dorset education. At one time, Lloyd actually had a business that was so thriving it employed more people than. Uh, the university. Uh, that shows you the kind of businessman he was before the accident. And we'll talk about that later if you've got time. Yeah, no, uh, all, it's, all it's the time nice. in the world. Okay. Re regarding what Faradun, uh, the, the, the idea of um, some of the things that, that were there at the time, just to put a perspective on it, you know, when programs needed to be sent to Tandy for review, uh, and they had to be done overnight, uh, because we were dialing out on a 300 baud modem, um, it, it was like just a small sample. It wasn't even the whole program. <laughs> it would take like all night, wouldn't it, Faradun, to, to yeah. put the phone receiver on the on the modem hook, and you know, <clears throat> just the, about. Yeah. So, in terms of, did we feel like we were doing something innovative? Well, I'd never worked on a modem before, but I, I did do it because I was in the uh, writing and video and uh, theatrical departments at the University of Oklahoma, I, I kind of did eat up a lot of the technology that the university had. So because of that, I got very involved in, in, in filmmaking. And uh, over the course of probably, I don't know, maybe a, a month's worth of Sundays, I was able to, to uh, coerce everybody into coming out surreptitiously and shooting a Super 8 film of... Dorset Educational Systems, uh, which was called Terminal, and it's it, that's actually probably be interesting for you guys to see because you will actually see the computer systems at work with graphics and animations that we did for the film. Yes, and you see yes. the facility. You see the facility inside and out. Uh, people co coming out of their cars and clocking in and going up through their terminals and having at it. <laughs> you still have this film? <laughs> oh yeah, yeah, I have it. Yeah, in, so. in what format? Uh, I do have a digital transfer. It's not a very good one, but um, I could probably, yeah, I could probably sh put something up on YouTube for you to look at. Please do. Oh, that would be wonderful. Yeah. I, it, it, not just from for the benefit of the podcaster, but for my research as well. I'm actually in the middle of putting together a book that. Uh, oh delves into the archaeology of the Atari educational system and uh, all of the uh, all of the bits and pieces behind it as well as have all the background so I'm sure um, I'm sure there you know although when Faraday and I were were most active at Dorset uh, the TRS-80 color computer pretty much took over our lives for for the the, the long, longest period of time probably a couple of years but I'm sure in the film you'll see pans across computer system tables that show the Atari system um, that you'll, you'll be able to look at. Mm -hmm. That's but most, most and of I, the animations sure. and things were done on the, the color computer. Mm -hmm. Gotcha. I do remember uh, on, on graphics, 
my favorite graphic, um, well, Faradun did a, a very interesting animation, which he probably doesn't want to talk about. <laughs> oh, you must, Faradun. I insist. <laughs> I don't, which one are you talking I'm not sure what he's talking about. It's the only one that I can remember that's inappropriate, but I shouldn't put you on the spot like that. <laughs> uh, um, well, you know, I... I I remember we just um, we had to I don't know break the monotony somehow I I, I don't know think about it I was a 25 year old uh, college <laughs> graduate uh, who had been in this country for maybe just seven eight years maybe less actually and uh, didn't know much much of anything else and uh, here I am in the middle of uh, nowhere and uh, with, with these uh, crazy guys, John and others. And uh, so it kind of brings out all the demons out of you, basically. And uh, um, yeah, we, we had a lot of fun. Uh, and But uh, nevertheless, uh, I think it's really good idea for John to uh, put that uh, that uh, mm, tape, that movie that, uh, that he made on, on YouTube, because that will give you guys a glimpse of what the our workstations were like because uh, you, you'll see all the equipment in there and uh, and uh, I think that would be great John oh well thank you it's good good deflection uh, <laughs> <laughs> I was okay. just about to say that mm -hmm. yeah my uh, I'll tell you what my favorite graphic was that I did I'm very very proud of it the script called for um, a, there was a there's a baby crying and you, I forget exactly what the the program was even about, but it had something to do with a baby, and I had to put up on the screen a graphic of a baby. Now, you try and figure out how to do an ASCII character of a baby. <laughs> uh, I figured it out. I cracked, I cracked the code. I figured out how to do it. So I designed a table, and on top of the table, because, oh, it had something to do with the, 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 baby, the babies on the table crying. Um, why there's a baby on the table, I don't know. That's probably why it was crying. But um, I thought long and hard about this, and I, I looked down at the computer keyboard, and I summoned up all the creativity that I could, and I hit Shift-7, and I had a baby on top of the table, an ampersand. <laughs> if you look at an ampersand, it looks like a little baby sitting on top of a table. That's right. <laughs> Never going to be able to unsee that now. <laughs> There's just wow. a little head and the little, yeah, it's, just, it's perfect. Anyway, that's, that's my, uh, my, graphic, <laughs> my, my graphic glory. Yeah, uh, John, correct me if I'm wrong. Um, the, the type of graphics that we were really able to create was uh, um, all we could do was just uh, turn on a uh, square or a rectangular small block on on the screen and uh, um, and then that's all we could do and just put them together somehow uh, and 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 illustrate come up with the concept of uh, a table or a car or, or something right. like that that's yeah. very similar it's very similar to the Atari uh, talk and teach where basically you've got uh, 96 or so uh, graphic characters that you can use in the character set, which were all look like they were custom designed, because I can't find any mappings of those characters anywhere else except right. in the system. Yeah. Uh, uh, that would be interesting to find where that came from. So you can draw those characters. You can uh, set a highlight color that you can use to turn on in certain sections of the screen. Yep. And you can turn, uh, you can choose to turn the text inside that highlight on or off, so you can make things appear or disappear at different times. And you had some rudimentary uh, cursor control. That was yeah. pretty much the extent of the whole thing. Yeah, that's a, 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 actually that's the, the probably the best description I've heard. And the, the distinction with the color computer, of course, we had we had an I believe an 8K version and a 16K version. Yes, 16K. Was like top of the line, you know, um, and I, I believe it was you know you 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 would get for the lower res you would get uh, four pixels inside a square that you could turn off and on, and for okay. the 16k I think you had uh, maybe eight I don't know I can't remember oh but, yeah you had you were using you were using the uh, 
the uh, semi graphics character set that was that was part of the color computer, so you could right. do uh, rudimentary right. pixel graphics. So, yep. And, and by turning off the pixels off and on, you you would you would kind of fake and simulate color. Uh, yep. It would it would it basically it fools the eye into thinking that that's green. That's Artifacting. Red. Yeah. Yeah. It's it's you're you're using yeah. the uh, chroma artifacting that was possible right, right. in the color computer. Yeah, and when, Fer- when Faradin talks about the camera that was next to his terminal, you know, so we'd start with be- being able to to just do a, a quick, almost like a scan of a, of an existing image that was usually drawn hand drawn by an artist in the design department. And then we would camera key it into the computer, digitize it, and then go in and spend hours cleaning it up. Uh, so there were not any artifacts or relics of the of the scan, and once it got all cleaned up, then we would actually have to, uh, because the it's limited how much data you could uh, send into the computer, you couldn't send all the data at one time. So you would you would uh, you know uh, blast out a little bit, and then what what through a system I believe that they referred to as budgeting, mm-hmm. uh, you would budget in a certain portion of graphics and have to create kind of a almost a, a matrix of how you were going to get a certain graphic to show up by a certain frame and make sure all the data had been fed into the computer appropriately. It was very, very difficult to do. Um, you, in other words, if you had a picture of a, of a woman or face of a woman, it may take five or six frames of, scan, of, of blasting in the data, and then a, a code would go in to update all the data that was already there but it just wasn't showing on the screen, and then it would update it, hmm. and then and then you'd have to overwrite that afterwards because you got a picture of a of a bicycle coming up in four frames. My God, how are you going to get the bicycle on the screen? <laughs> so it was this constant kind of ebb and flow of how to get the data managed uh, so it would update itself. Um, yeah, to correct what John said, uh, uh, Radio Shack's color computer came in two flavors. 4K and uh, 16K. In fact, as I look at these uh, cassettes in front of me, some of them say uh, 16K and uh, some say 4K. So, wow. Yep. The um, the Atari variation uh, of the master cartridge, uh, actually, it came in an 8K cartridge, but the funny thing was uh, the actual program itself was only 2K. And the uh, Atari Educational Master System cartridge was was done early enough in Atari's development cycle that there was on the drawing board for the Atari 400-800 that uh, it was originally going to be a 4K machine and an 8K machine. Well, uh, this was probably the only... A program that Atari had done outside of their earliest games that was designed to run on a 4K machine, which they never shipped. Wow. Mm-hmm. So, yeah. Fascinating. <laughs> Yes. Interesting. <laughs> Is it time to talk about the car crash? Oh, the accident. Well, it wasn't a car crash. Uh, Faraday, you, you, you know this story better than I do. John, I don't remember it. Could you go ahead? Uh... Oh, I'll, I'll get you started. Lloyd was in downtown campus corner area of Norman and was crossing the street, and a motorist came by and hit him. And he apparently to the point where he fell over and, you know, there was an injury sustained of some, some sort. And uh, he ultimately sued the, the driver of the car uh, because and this was a number of, I don't know how long it was afterwards, but it was not an immediate thing that happened. He, he, he ended up suing the, the, the driver and claiming that... Um, the driver was responsible for his business failures that had that had ensued since the accident, because <laughs> before the accident he was a genius, and after the accident he was no longer a genius. <laughs> and apparently, as the story goes, because it makes a great story, um, he lost the case because, the, as the in, as the judge said, you did not sufficiently prove to this court that you were a genius beforehand. <laughs> <laughs> oh, <laughs> but in our eyes, to the to the employees who loved him, he was very much a genius in so many different ways. The only thing that I remember is that he always drove a Cadillac, a big yes. Cadillac. Yes. Oh, that's 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 a great little story. Chris told me the the gentleman who had the company out here that that licensed the software. 
uh, his first time visiting Dorset Educational Systems, he got picked up at the airport by a gentleman who had black gloves and a chauffeur's cap and was dressed you know, in a very, uh, very nice suit, uh, black, and said nothing to him. Had this little, little salt and pepper mustache, held up his sign with his name on it, picked him up at the airport, got his bag, walked him to the car, and uh, opened up the back door. He drove all the way down from the airport in Oklahoma City down to Norman. It's about an hour drive. Down to the Goldsby Airport, up the meandering uh, driveway, parks the car, gets out at the carport that's right in front of the door, opens the door for, for Chris, closes the door, takes him inside, walks over, puts his hat up on the on the coat rack, pulls off his glove, turns around and says, hello, I'm Lori Dorset. <laughs> <laughs> That's the kind wow. of guy he was. And later that day, as I said before, he would then serve him a, a cup of soup. Uh, okay. Big my, question, my question is, uh, um, do you guys have access to any of these... Um, uh, programs that we did for for the color computer do they exist in any form or uh, the only thing shape? that we currently have the only thing that we currently have and Kevin and I just went through the ringer of digitizing 45 different sets of all the Atari stuff we don't have anything else uh, I would personally be interested in, in anything else that I could find as well so you know <laughs> uh, I know I know I have uh, TRS-80 color computer programs uh, I, I saved them as my wife was about ready to throw them away about 15 years ago. I pulled them out of the, the, the trash. I did not save the computers, though, which is really <laughs> the stupid thing, right? I uh, saved the programs, but I didn't save the computers. Well, the uh, computers are replaceable. Those programs yeah. are probably not. Yeah. You know, the, the, the that, was my, that was my <laughs> thinking at the time, too. So, and, 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 can and I, May I borrow them to digitize them? Sure. I, I mean, it's going to require me going through my... My extensive archives, which is <laughs> oh, that's fine with me. <laughs> yeah. yeah, we can. Yeah. We'll go through it again. Yeah, I, I would have to be happy to do that because uh, yeah, that's that's part of the that's part of the process. When we take the when, and we bring these in, we we take them, digitize them, we clean them up, we uh, mask off the noise of the audio channels, and what comes out is, to the best of our abilities, a, a nice reconstructed set of content that can be played, for example, in an emulator or dumped back up to tape. There, there's two things that shock me about this. First of all, that there's nostalgia over it. <laughs> Secondly, that the tapes aren't demagnetized and, and have any content on them whatsoever. Oh, uh, be be lucky. Um, we were actually very fortunate. Um, if you if you've ever had to do a restoration of uh, large reel to reel masters like I have, uh, especially during that time period when they were experimenting with different oxides and different adhesives and stuff, there's actually a case where uh, tapes during this time period they tend to take on moisture because of the adhesive that's used. So if you try to take these big reel to reels and throw them and throw them in a Studer tape deck. Uh, chances are you're going to take and, and strip off the oxide. The oxide is just going to come right off the tape. So you literally have to take, throw these tapes into an oven at 200 degrees for like two or three hours to drive all the moisture out, and then you've got a chance at actually taking and doing a dupe of them. Thankfully, we haven't, we didn't have to do that with any of this stuff. Wow. <laughs> what's, what's fascinating to me is that this, this, uh, the audio portions have been resurrected several times. They've gone through multiple lives because remember they started off originally as uh -huh. recordings for audiovisual teaching machines. Mm -hmm. And and they and they keep getting regenerated and, and reborn into these different formats. Oh yeah. That, and they're still live. Yes. It, it, trust me. It, yeah, it freaks me out too, trust me. Uh, and we, yeah. We had we were digitizing hundreds and hundreds of tapes and uh, Tom told me he needed to stop for a while because he had the narrator's voice in his dreams. Yes. Yeah, that, that was probably Dave Stanton. <laughs> yes. yes. Somewhere, oh, somewhere, this is great. You guys would love this. Somewhere I have an outtake tape of Dave Stanton reading the, these remedial scripts and cursing like a sailor in between them. 
talking about how stupid and obnoxious they are. <laughs> oh, that's that sounds like that sounds like an Orson Welles moment right yeah, there. Yeah. I've got some. I've got Orson Welles outtakes that are just yeah, fantastic. It's, it's, oh yes. Oh, it's please green, find that. It's, it's the green keys moment. <laughs> Just like the green keys that Orson Welles went through, yeah, he he just break. You can hear the guy; it's palpable. He just breaks down uh, while, while he's recording. <laughs> uh, yeah, well, anything you find, any papers, any tapes, uh, especially the outtakes and that stuff. Yeah, please send it. Let, let me digitize them. We'll send them back. Uh, that'd be awesome. Yes. Yeah. Uh, speaking of th- things that we have, I just remembered. I do have uh, from Dorset. Um, a Radio Shack uh, uh, Model 1, I think it's called, uh, computer, because at that point, at at times, Dorset would let some employees uh, do do work at home for some reason. And and I think he let me uh, borrow one of these machines and take him home so I could do some work. And uh, and ironically, I ended up... uh, owning it or keeping it never returning it yeah i still have it and and a friend of mine years ago gave me a a radio shack uh, color computer i've never used it but i think he told me that it's uh, it's it's in working condition i have those two plus i have these uh cassettes that are looking at me in front of me i do not know uh if i can uh, i will i think um I, I have become enough curious to try to see if I can play them on on the uh, on the uh, uh, color computer. I have three programs in front of me. That that's all I have from those days. Okay, if mm. I, if I can, if you could maybe send a picture, I'd like to see if you have, and maybe I, I I'll ask to to borrow those as well. Sure. Um, if they don't, yeah. they, I'm sure they're different from what John has because uh, yeah, we want to digitize as much as possible. My the only thing I've managed to find is is if I do a go to my library's website and I can search other libraries. There there are a smattering of these tapes at various libraries around the the globe that do interlibrary loans, but they don't do interlibrary loans for computer programs, only books. So these things are out there, but I have no way to get to them. It's very frustrating. Oh. So. And it's sad. Yeah. <laughs> it is sad. Especially, I mean, just from the historical aspect of this, because this, these, this particular set of uh, programs, this this whole block of things represents what is in my mind uh, a major milestone in computer aided instruction mm-hmm. that needs to be that needs to be preserved and understand and well understood. Yeah, I, you know, in all seriousness, not not. I don't mean to jest with you about the the nostalgia aspect, but I I, I think you're right. There, there is, there, it was a it was a piece of history. It was a period of time, and it was space that nobody else was in. So it does make it a very interesting part of history. It's very distinctive. You uh, you probably already know that uh, the Atari system when 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 they stopped doing it, Faradun, it was pretty early on. Uh, in the transition from uh, the potential of 1,024 programs being created, I think Atari killed it before they ever got even maybe about they, a third of the way there. I, I think basically, Atari had licensed Atari had licensed uh, 16 tapes or 16 lesson blocks from Dorset at that time, and then when they reverted the li- the reverted it back. Uh, you know, we've got 45. We've got 45 different lesson blocks back from when they reverted it back. So, okay, but know. but not not to entice you too much because it probably it would be impossible to find. But I'm sure that Dorset produced a lot more than they ever turned over to Atari because there was a schedule, a flight schedule for when they would be given out. And I know that Jerry Jerry Hughes is Jerry the, Hughes, yeah, Jerry Hughes. There, I told you we'd get it. Uh, mm. Jerry Hughes, was, I, I believe, had gone through uh, more than uh, more than three or four hundred easily, wow. which would which, nice. would which would probably be a, probably a couple hundred more than what the Atari ever saw. If, if we ever, yeah, if if we find if we ever find it, that would be you know that would be a miracle. Yeah. Uh, mm-hmm. Until then, you know, if somebody decides on a whim that they want to make some new ones, well, you know, now they can. (laughs) (laughs) 
among all the other things that that Lloyd did, in addition to all the um, the, the technology stuff, he was also another interesting facet of him is he was also a, an investor in a film that is notorious. Uh, a notorious B movie that was made in Norman, Oklahoma, starring B movie uh, actress Beverly Garland, who you may may not remember depending on your age, uh, mm -hmm. yes. played played the uh, mother who married Fred McMurray and My Three Sons, uh, among other things. That was probably the way I came to know her. But the movie is called Stark Fear, and inside the um, Fair, do you remember this? Inside. The closet where the alarm system was kept that we had to turn off when we went inside. Uh -huh. uh, if we were the first in, we got to the privilege of going over and turning the key to turn off the alarm. Uh, who was going to respond? I don't know because I don't <laughs> think the sheriff would go out there and find out who's breaking into the place. And who would who would want to break in? I don't know. But inside the closet where the security system was were the original prints of this film, Stark Fear, that Lloyd, <laughs> Lloyd produced. And a, the film professor who I took classes with at the University of Oklahoma, a gentleman named Ned Hockman, directed the film. And if you look it up online, look up Stark Fear, Beverly Garland, you can find interviews with her. And she basically claims it was the worst experience in her life <laughs> because she had to not only come to Oklahoma, but be directed by Ned Hockman for a script, which was basically kind of like this bizarro... Um, exploitation film and uh, I, I, the plot line esca escapes me right now but um, you know there's spousal abuse there's all kinds of you know uh, very weird stuff that goes on I think it was made in the late 50s or early 60s hmm. um, Stark Fear the worst experience because she had to st spend time at the um, uh, motel outside of Norman Oklahoma on Route 8 I believe is that the route that goes out there Faraday? Um, is it Route 8? Uh, I don't remember. I, I know where it's located, but uh, I don't know if it's... Uh, um, yeah, could be. And I do have, as, as sort of my farewell gift before I left Norman for Oklahoma, or for uh, California, uh, I guess sometimes you do leave Norman for Oklahoma, but <laughs> I, I, left, I left with Lloyd's blessing because I was coming out here to work for one of his, his license, licensees. Um, I left with um, the original reel-to-reel uh, -reel recordings of the soundtrack that was recorded by the University of Oklahoma Symphony. <laughs> oh. The soundtrack to that film. I still nice. have that. Yeah, that's it's, it's off the subject, but it's fascinating because it again tells you this pa paints a little bit of a picture of a a very interesting man. Yeah. So, John, you left to go work for who? Uh, I, I left uh, to, to come to California, actually, to, to pursue a writing career. Uh -huh. And one of the first things that I did when I got out here was look for work, because that's what you have to do. Right. And uh, it, uh, it just so happened that uh, the license deal had just gone through, and um, I ended up working for uh, Compass Software, which was one of the licensees of Dorset Educational Systems uh, programs. They're, they're the company that did a lot of the uh, uh, marketing for the software that Chris Cherick had had uh, had gotten uh, from Lloyd, and uh, I'm trying to remember the name of of the company that Chris had. But uh, there's a gentleman named Sam Mendelo uh, who worked at Compass or Courseware Research, and he was he was one of the guys along with um, a gentleman named um, Tim Tim Tapper, I think, uh, and, they, and the two of them had created a, a partnership to uh, to market these uh, programs out to the rest of the world. Mm -hmm. And uh, and Chris was the the basically the the direct licensee between uh, Lloyd and uh, and these gentlemen that were doing the marketing. And so I worked. In between those two companies, Faradun, how did your time at Dorset come to an end? Um, I worked at Dorset from 1981 till 1983, and um, what happened was that there was a, a lady who worked there, and uh, her name was uh, Sherry Jarvis, I believe. Uh, yeah. On yes, yes, and uh, she. Uh, 
had seen an ad uh, in the paper um, where uh, the Canberra University in Lawton, Oklahoma, they were looking um, for someone uh, to hire. Uh, this was a teaching position, and uh, I uh, <clears throat> found it interesting, and I applied. And uh, I got the job, and uh, in 1983, summer of 83, I left uh, Dorset and I moved to Lawton, Oklahoma, started teaching at Cameron University, uh, teaching computer science, and I ended up loving uh, um, teaching um, and uh, ended up staying here all these years. I've been here for 32 years just uh, uh, at the university teaching computer science. And you're still waiting for tenure. <laughs> no, I got my tenure years years ago, but... Uh, if, if, uh, if Boyd were running the university, you would not have tenure yet. <laughs> oh, oh, that's right. But, but, uh, you'd be, but you'd be making 30 cents an hour more than you would. When that, you that's right. And uh, ironically, I also, for some reason, kept the last uh, pay stub the, that uh, I got at uh, Dorset's. And uh, and it looks like I was making six dollars and seventy five cents. Uh, that was my last uh, hourly rate in nineteen eighty three. Nice. Wow. Those were the days. Yeah, but uh, after we left, after I left, uh, um, Dorset was still in business and in operation. I believe uh, even one time I met John and his wife. At uh, uh, Dorset's, I believe, or outside, yes. we went out there, yeah. took some pictures. Yeah, and uh, they—I don't know how long they stayed in operation. John probably knows more than I do. Uh, so, but that's what I've been doing. Just uh, after Dorset, I've been teaching all these years. John, when did Dorset come to to a conclusion, to an end? When did they close their doors? Um, you know, I don't know. The, probably the better person to ask on that would be Tim Boggs. I don't recollect exactly what the year was. Uh, I, I know that they sold out to another, another. I think it was a family that purchased what was left. Lloyd was getting a little, little tired, I think, and uh, was looking to re to retire. And they they retained him as a consultant to the company, and the other company did something else as well, and they were using. Lloyd's database uh, of uh, school systems in the in the deep south uh, to sell something else. I don't remember what it was. That's my recollection anyway. I, I remember, you know, Tim. Tim uh, was there. I think till the very end, wasn't he? Or did he leave beforehand? Uh, that I don't remember. Uh, but uh, the only thing that I remember is that when I started in 1981. Um, I think Lloyd was just working on the last phases of his um, his production for Atari because I believe uh, Jerry Hughes was the only person who used to work on on, uh, on the Atari machine and the rest of us started working on uh, uh, the, uh, the color computer. Right. Actually, yeah. we started working on Model 1 and uh, soon after that... Uh, we moved up to uh, the color computer, right? Yeah, the only the only uh, uh, experience I had with the Atari was when I got out here and had to do some adjustments to uh, title screens and some of the graphics that had gone berserk uh, when they would when they would be replayed. There was you know it, it, there were there there were no, they're noisy programs as you know, mm -hmm. and so I'd have to go in and kind of clean up some of the graphics. Some of the bits would come over and throw throw characters all over the screen. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I know Tom can speak to that. Any little pop or click on the tape and it would uh, just throw all sorts of garbage on the screen. That he Yeah, absolutely. Oh, Jesus. <laughs> <laughs> um, all right, what haven't we asked you that we should have? Well, I guess my question would be, what is it that you really wanted to find out by interviewing us? Uh, you know, we just want to know what it was like to uh, to work there and how your jobs were done and and just uh, painting a picture. And I think you both have done that. So I've gotten what I came for. Is, is there anyone else that you're you're chasing after that you haven't been able to pull up? I, have, I think you 
I sure. think you have na- you've named the one one person that we definitely need to go after. Uh, Jerry so, Hughes. Yes. Yeah, yes. Okay. Put out another LinkedIn feeler to someone else. Uh, I think it was a manager guy. Hold on a second. I want to say Sam. Oh, Sam Mandelo. Yes. He has not responded to me yet, but that's... yeah, if if he does, let me know because he's dead. <laughs> oh, all right then. Yeah, he okay. he was he was actually one of the, one of the gentlemen that was in uh, uh, involved in marketing the programs out here in California. All right, well, tell me a story about Sam since he can't do it for it for me. Uh, well, you see, um, he was kind of a sharky, snarky guy. Uh, I, I don't re- I don't remember a whole lot about him other than uh, I think the the interaction he had with Lloyd was was not real real close um, and ultimately everything kind of fell apart for them from a marketing stand I, I don't think they ultimately are able to successfully get a lot of the content that they had acquired out to the market hmm. and that was causing some some rifts obviously from personality standpoint. Uh, when I knew him, he was probably in his 60s. So, you know, um, he I, he probably moved right out of not doing any more with Dorset into retirement at that point. Can you think that another question just popped in my mind? Can you think of any other uh, topics that you guys considered coming out with uh, lessons on that that didn't pan out? Uh, maybe, yeah. Maybe. There, oh, I, gosh. I, you know, I would. I, I do remember there was a gentleman named Jim Lewis. Do you remember Jim Faraday? Um, Jim. No, no. What did he do? Jim Lewis was he was the gentleman from Princeton that was hired. Jacques Louis. Oh yes, I remember him. Yes. Okay. Right. So he, you know, everyone had a nickname there, and Jim <laughs> Lewis's name was Jacques Louis because he was very affected. Uh, and, <laughs> <laughs> um, very bright guy, and he he and I pitched a couple of different uh, programs that I don't think ever went anywhere, but Lloyd found them fascinating and said, you know, keep at it. I'm trying to remember what some of them were, but they were, I think there was one on art history. We we, we talked about, because uh, Jim and I, when we would get together socially, we would talk about art history a lot, and um, and that was a void in in the uh, subject categories that Lloyd had already done. Mm-hmm. Uh, and as, as it turned out, you know, pretty much everything that, that was pitched to Lloyd wasn't really going to go anywhere. And I think it, you know, smart people figured it out pretty quickly that he was all about reutilizing existing assets yeah. and, uh, and trying to you know, milk them for all they were worth. Yes, John is right. I think, uh, um, it was brought to Lloyd's attention to try some new uh, s- titles, uh, but he, uh, I think he found he found it more uh, um, useful business-wise to just recycle what he had. Uh, he was pretty much saying that I've got these 1,024 titles uh, available, so why don't we just uh, convert them to whatever platform and 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 sell them instead of investing in, in new new titles that's that's that was his passion just uh, reusing what he had recycling all those titles do you know if there was any thought into recycling them for the uh, IBM PC I never heard that from him so I I doubt it seriously yeah I don't recollect the IBM being mentioned but as, as Faraday was talking it reminded me that I I've got a, a storage box that's got some Dorset uh, material in it, and I'm just you know trying to think, uh, um, close my eyes and imagine what's in the box. And I know that one that I probably got one of those one of those cassette uh, binders that you're talking about, where the, there were 16 programs, uh, 16 cassettes in them. I think I have one of those, and I think I've got some literature, some collateral that was produced, awesome. and probably and probably some files of scripts that were that were submitted. Uh, that didn't go anywhere, so that might give you some insight. And I probably have some old scripts that were that were edited too. If you, oh, want. neat. I don't know if that makes any. Fantastic. Yeah, we want to see all of that, please. Okay. Um, and you either you just send it to me, and I'll scan it, or 
scan it yourself, or but I just I want to see it actually. <laughs> okay. Let me borrow it, please. That would okay. be awesome. Now my question is, Tom, um, the, mm -hmm. uh, the Atari version of uh, Dorset programs were identical to what we were producing in terms of the format, where you uh, would see a frame and then some text and uh, maybe graphics and uh, audio, and then the uh, question would be asked, and then you would select one. Yeah. To be. Yeah. Essentially, uh, it, you know. Uh, the text and the the text and the uh, the text in the frame and the audio uh, would be delivered at the same time. It would stream across at roughly about uh, thirty characters a second. So you know, like uh, they they converted over from three hundred baud cassette to six hundred baud, but it was still playing at three hundred baud three hundred baud rate, and so it would stream across. Uh, ask the question and then wait for the uh, and wait for the answer. You know, either one, two, or three. Uh, there were some edge cases where you where it would just say to push a character, so you would push the space bar, or push the enter key, or whatever to advance to the next frame. Uh, you would have frames that were uh, different colors um, and interesting color palette there um, because it's mostly reds. Uh, like four reds and a blue and a green. <laughs> For, um, this is and, on a computer uh, that that could do, you know, at the time, yeah, two hundred fifty-six colors. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so, ugh, so selling a little short. Um, so, and uh, in in the case of the Atari, it was backwards from the the masters that Dorset had had shipped, in that the data track was in the right hand side of the tape. Uh, and the audio would be in the left-hand side. So, you know, apparently Atari had a development workstation that would have uh, a demodulator that was jerry-rigged onto the machine. Yeah. That would L Lloyd did all that. That was that was part of what he what he patented, and and that's why Atari was was doing the deal with them. Mm-hmm. So and. So that's really what I'm interested in from, from my perspective there is the original system that Talk and Teach was developed on because a lot of the uh, specifications for what Talk and Teach was developed on, uh, there's a word that comes to mind, um, bespoke. <laughs> uh -huh. um, it, it looks like the, the original hardware that Talk and Teach was developed on was extremely custom. Mm -hmm. Uh, patterned kind of after like Don Lancaster's TV typewriter. Uh, yeah. I'm I'm guessing it was designed on some sort of S100 based machine. Um, you know, with the big with the, with the card cage and lots of cards and the demodulator plugged into a serial port uh, using a tape format that's basically Kansas City standard, so 300 bits per second. And then, you know, all of that was basically Jerry rigged onto an Atari running the Master System cartridge that was literally converting the data in real time and then streaming it back out mm -hmm. in the Atari format after that was all said and done. That part of the equation I was able to figure out from Atari's engineering documents where they were basically cursing the quality of the uh, cassettes that they were getting from Dorset left and right. Mm. They were they were like, yeah, these things have so many problems. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, and I, I think, I think <laughs> you, you probably just kind of, uh, touched upon one of the reasons why, despite the sales volume that Lloyd talked about of those of those uh, cartridges, um, there was pro there's probably a high return factor that wasn't considered by Lloyd, and that's where Atari found the rub because the you know, they're they're just fraught with problems. Uh, yeah, and it's it's it very tight tolerances uh, that are required to uh, that are required to interpret these tapes and and to really make it work and uh, yeah, well, that, that you brought up an excellent point, uh, Faraday. Remember, um, th these things were so tedious that the little cassette tape that um, that you would uh, that you would use to run the program, if the volume was set above five, you know, midway between five and six. It would throw out garbage, 
If it was yeah. brought down, if it was brought down to four to five, it was like that. Just that's the sweet spot. It would work. <laughs> yes, that's the old. Yeah, and one thing to really one thing to really drive home here the uh, cassette the cassette recorders that were used for the Atari cassette recorders they did they were not repurposed uh, audio cassette recorders they were recorders that were built specifically. Yes. They plugged right up to the computer, That's and right. they had uh, they had auto gain control circuitry on them, which automatically yeah. adjusted volume levels and stuff. Yeah, so we as, avoided some of those problems. As I, as I recall, that was that's part of the system that Lloyd would sell. Uh, that's part of what you would get. He, he I, I believe he wasn't Cleve doing those. Like they had a little assembly line going and making them for uh, the market. Right. But I believe uh, the ones that uh, they use with uh, Model 1 and uh, the color computer, these were just ordinary uh, audio yes. cassette players. They plugged, they plugged. Uh, they're right. just yep. Audio. Yep. yep, exactly. Well, well, when you got the color computer, it came with a cassette player, didn't it? Didn't have to. It didn't yeah, have to. It was an, an add-on. But the, it, was yeah. a, it was a Tandy cassette player. Because I remember it being gray with the red record button. It matched. It was color schemed to match the color computer. Yes, yes. but it was just a cassette it's, player. Um, Any cassette player would have worked. It was yeah. optional. Yeah. 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 Mm -hmm. Well, I think I'm about done. Uh, do you have any more questions, Tom? No, I think I'm good too. Okay. Thank you guys um, so much. You, oh, thank you. Uh, you. You both are aware of the fact that you could probably order up some of Lloyd's uh, books that he wrote back in the '70s too, right? Uh, Tom and I own, uh, actually, both own one. <laughs> okay. I have right here in front of me uh, Audio Visual Teaching Machines, written by Lloyd G. Dorsett, uh, August 1971. Yeah, it's the only book I found, and I, I own that one, too. Were there yeah. others? That's I believe there's others, but I, I think that's probably his dissertation repurposed, don't you think, Faraday? Wasn't it about that time? Uh, could be. That's very possible. Because Lloyd, Lloyd, Lloyd had degrees in physics and mathematics, and I mean, he was a very educated guy. So basically, he was sticking with his uh, ideology of repurposing content by uh, making That's a book right. out of it. <laughs> That's <Yeah>. right. <laughs> yep. Love it. Makes perfect sense. Well, thank you both so much. Thank you. You're welcome. Thank you very much. Thank you for taking me yes. back 30-some-odd uh, years ago. <laughs> yeah, it was, it was a delight. Thanks a lot, Take guys. Care. Thanks. All right. Take care. Bye-bye. If you enjoyed these interviews and would like to contribute something, I encourage you instead to donate to one of our favorite organizations, the Internet Archive, at archive.org. The Internet Archive is a nonprofit digital library with the stated mission of universal access to all knowledge. They've done incredible things to preserve computer history, including hosting thousands of programs in an in-browser Atari emulator, creating the Wayback Machine, and offering full-page scans of countless Atari computer books and magazines. Make your tax-deductible contribution at archive.org donate.